a lot of what also needs to come really strongly in my journey is the different individuals who've been there at different stages of my career who noticed a particular skill or noticed potential and help drive me in the right direction whether it's the ushahidi founders the heathers of this world or the coaches that i have now it's something that i i'm also trying to be very intentional about passing along looking at my journey i am someone who joined the team at the lowest level and i grew up the ranks it would be interesting to see somebody else on my team do the same thing hello and welcome to inspiring open candid conversations with influential women whose careers and open ethos have pushed the boundaries of what it means to build community and succeed as a collective i am betty kankambwedu a journalist and women's rights advocate join me as i explore the fascinating back stories behind africa's most tenacious female personalities inspiring open is a podcast series from wiki loves women a project of wiki in africa be inspired be challenged be bold on inspiring open today is angela lungati angela's interest in technology started when as a little girl she would play with her father's computer Now that interest has evolved into a passion for building and using appropriate technology tools to impact the lives of marginalized people. She has over 10 years of experience in software development, global community engagement and non-profit organizational management. She is the executive director at Ushahidi, a global non-profit tech company that helps communities quickly collect and share information that enables them to raise voices, inform decisions and influence change. Angela sits on the Creative Commons board of directors and is also a co-founder of Akira Chicks, a non-profit organization that nurtures generations of women who use technology to develop innovations and solutions for Africa. Let's get right into the conversation. Let's start from the very beginning. Tell us about your childhood and how you were brought up. Okay, so um fun fact is I was actually born in Ukraine. Uh, my parents were in school at the time. I think I was born when mom and dad were both in second year. Um, so yes, born in a very very cool country. <laughs> um, then I probably spent about the the first year and a half of my life with them while they were juggling school um, and and having a small baby. Uh, but at some point, I think it became critical for them to kind of focus on studies. So I was sent back and I lived with my cousins for about six months before my mom decided, Nah, I can't, I can't do this. I can't be away from my child for too long. So uh, she came and got me. um and i went back with them so was there with them until they graduated and then we moved back to kenya i have absolutely no recollection of that 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 period in my life um i hear stories that when i came back to kenya all i could speak was russian um now i can't speak a single word of russian <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah that that that's basically you know um my early early life i am the first born um in a family of well three w- we were three children my brother died in 2006 oh, I'm so sorry it's just and my my younger brother who's no longer young anymore he's he's 18 about to f- uh, finish high school so that's uh, fairly interesting um i i guess you could say i come from a very close knit uh, very loving and involved family um had very strict parents very very strict parents um but and now in adulthood i can see why I, i can actually see why they were so um keen being the only girl being the first one um and just the kind of world that we're living in just trying to make sure that they were giving me the best um that they possibly could um fairly humble upbringings i mean when we moved back to kenya we moved into um do they call them studios it was like a, a one bedroom a one bedroomed house and then as time went by as my parents career grew we we moved into bigger houses <laughs> yeah that's how i would describe my my childhood um but with lots of very fond memories um of having very involved parents um who actually inspired me to do what i do now your parents are engineers and your love for tech started when your dad brought his laptop home right yes it is so um 
Yeah, my my mom and my dad were studying engineering at the time that they met and when I decided to, you know, bless the world with my presence. Um so all through my childhood I have memories of dad tinkering with soldering irons and things like that. Um and then they both got into the workforce here in Kenya um as engineers. So at I was always drawn to do what mommy and daddy were doing. I think every most, if not all children, look up to their parents and like, oh, I'd really like people to go and do that. And so I always knew from a very young age that I wanted to do something in engineering because I proud I would proudly announce my mom is an engineer, my dad is an engineer. So I think my dad came home with one of his 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 work laptop. Um was I 12 probably or somewhere about that age and funny thing is we weren't doing anything very specific like it wasn't anything hardcore it was we used to play this game called Captain Claw that was like you'd find me and my younger brother at the time just huddling around dad and I was intrigued and that is where my my love for tech kind of grew so I'd go to school and in the computer classes because as much as we'd play that game, I would still kind of tinker around with Word and Excel, ETC. I'd always find myself feeling like I'm a bit ahead of the class to some extent because of the things that dad was showing me. And I thrived off of that. So my my love for tech is something that was ignited by my dad. And you went ahead to study computer science. Yes, I did. I went to Kanda School. Kanda School is where I went to high school. And once I was done with that, I enrolled at Strathmore University here in Nairobi in Kenya. Um, first, At first, it was to do um, a diploma in business information technology. So what tends to happen after you've graduated from high school is you have about a two-year gap between the point you're then admitted into, into university. And for me, I didn't want to spend that two years doing nothing. So I enrolled in a course thinking that, okay, I can, you know, wait to see which university I'm called to. At the time, I wanted something purely computer science. Um, I think it was either JQ, um, Jomo Kenyatta University um, or Kenyatta University. Um, but then Strathmore was there and I was like, okay, let me go ahead. Let me go and tinker around, just keep myself busy and still do something along the lines of what I like, which was, which was tech. But as I got deeper into the course, um, you know, we'd you know, dive into programming. But then there's also this element of how the tech is applicable in the real life um, on, on the business side of things that really drew me in. So I graduated from that course um, with the highest honors and decided, you know what, instead of trying, instead of leaving this and going to start something else uh, fresh somewhere else, why not use these credits to then join the degree program? So I then enrolled into the bachelor's um, bachelor's program for business information technology. Um, and I got in at about, I think in, in second year because I'd completed the diploma and just went through the entire program and graduated with first class honors in 2011. In between the time you graduated and the time you joined Ushahidi, what did you do during that period? So it's interesting. It's like there's actually an overlap. I should have mentioned this while I was telling a story. Clearly, I'm a bad storyteller. Anyway, um, so I met uh, Jessica Colasso while I was at Strathmore University. At the time, she was working for the Strathmore Research and Consultancy Center. So I think I was probably in second year or th- no, the second year where I worked with her um, as a de- on a project somewhere in Machakos as a data collector. And that's where our relationship grew. And at some point she transitioned out of the university to go do this very exciting thing you know be the the manager of Nairobi's fast innovation hub so she invited me over for the launch to volunteer and that's where I got to meet you know the the tech scene in Kenya I think before that the concept that most of us who are in school had about the tech scene was you know you're either working in you know very formal offices where you go in wearing a suit and sit behind a desk and do A, B, C, and D things. But here we were interacting with um, budding entrepreneurs who are doing, you know, going against the grain and really trying to figure out how to solve real real world problems with tech, um, startups, ETC. And that's where I got to meet those Shahidi founders. So I met I met uh, Eric, I met Juliana, I met Ori, um, and a bunch of 
other amazing people, including my Akira Chick School founders. So that was really exciting. And at that point, we were supposed to find internships, um, you know, get plugged into industry so that we could get some of the practical skills um, based off of what we were learning in class and then draft a report, draft a report based on that. And I chose to intern at the IHUB because that was it, it was just honestly it was really exciting. And when I look at when I look back now, that was such a defining moment in my career, quite honestly. If it wasn't for my interaction with people at the IHUB, I would probably be sitting behind a desk somewhere. Not to say that it's a bad thing, it's just there's an unconventional way about how the Nairobi tech scene um or just tech in general nowadays. Um operates it's not just you know your usual kind of go into an office at this time and at this time it's it's really focused on the impact that the technology is having and the outputs and i think that was the beginning of all of that just revolutionizing how we're thinking about work um generally so i interned at the ihub for three months um, and that's also when I got really plugged into the Ushahidi community a bit more. Um, it was probably two, no, three years into Ushahidi's existence. The first project that I volunteered for was the, the elections project, mm. um, monitoring the constitutional referendum of 2010. Okay. And again, my interest was really was really plugged in. So after my internship was done, I went back to school just really motivated and plugged in and I I would get many more of my friends to you know whenever I have was having events hey come in have a look at what's going on there so I was still kind of very plugged into the tech community while I was still in school so the point when I was graduating I reached out again to Jessica and I also reached out to Eric about hey guys I'm just about to finish really fi- trying to find a place where I can get plugged in, in into the in, into the workforce and I think at that point there was a bit of a tussle because Jessica wanted me to go back into the IHUB, but Eric was like, this one would be good at on the Ushahidi end. So I got into Ushahidi as a junior software developer um, and then graduated three months after joining the team um, as a junior software developer. What is the work of a junior software developer? So at the time, um, well, a software developer generally is someone who's actively involved in building the technology as well as maintaining it. Um, And of course, given that I was coming from school, as much as I had some experience, still needed some guidance from the senior. So I came in kind of shadowing the amazing developers who are part of the the engineering team of Ushahidi. So at the time, my role was, you know, identifying and fixing bugs, building a couple of features here and there, but not so heavy on that. Um, But then given my social nature, which I think goes against the grain of what many people think about um, developers. I'm also someone who's very passionate about engaging with people. And so I would find myself in spaces where, as I was trying to find those bugs to fix, working really closely with the people who are experiencing them. So this is, I will say, A, B, and C, D is not working. That will then push me into a mind space of, okay, let me figure out exactly what's causing this problem for this person and then figure out how to fix it. So a lot of the bugs that I was fixing were actually coming directly from feedback I was getting from people I was engaging with on the other end. So it's kind of like user support that then feeds into into the the development work. So that was the beginning of what many people term as being a human bridge began because I understood, I, I had a good understanding of what challenges people were facing on the on, on, on the on the user front and finding a way to then translate that into a feature that would then be would then be helpful. So that was what my role entailed um, in the first few years of my life as an Ushahidian. You know, I really love that you get to bring who you are to the job. So from here you got promoted to community developer liaison. How different was this role and what skill set did it require? One, one, one thing to, to be very clear about is the role that community engagement has played in Ushahidi's journey. Um, there's an element of people being able to learn and grow from one another, just a lot of knowledge sharing. And then there's also a strong bit around um, the community being a part of actually building the tool itself, right? Um, and that's a lot around the, the open source culture. And so at the time, our director of community engagement 
had a you know very very strong amazing woman who to this day i think i i really credit a lot of the the progression in my career to um heather leeson she she had to balance out um the technical the technical end of things as well as the user end really trying to nurture both of those communities nurturing the users to really become self sufficient trying to surface knowledge um around best practices and things that people have learned but at the same time also trying to nurture this open source community the the group of developers the people who would be identifying bugs and sending in pull requests and you know for for high the leadership team they they noticed that aspect of me being able to engage uh well with people and felt that i would add a lot of value in supporting heather um on that work so really coming into focus specifically um on supporting and um nurturing the the developer community so that's what that de- um community developer liaison role was all about and how many uh, years were you in that role not long because heather heather transitioned out a couple of months later so i ended up taking up the mantle of being the community manager and then a- a- along the way becoming the director of community engagement so i then had to hold the whole the whole spectrum of community engagement our users as well as the um as well as the development community and then you became a co-executive director and eventually an executive director and i think when you go through the ranks like that there is a certain sense of ownership you bring to the job not so yes in 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 very many ways i think the one of the the biggest reasons um that i got from the board when they were offering me this role was the the strong sense of advocacy for ushahidi's roots and the impact it creates um as one of the strong reasons why they felt that I I was the best person to take over. Now the thing to keep in mind is that um during my journey as director of community engagement there are also some really key milestones in Ushahidi's journey where it did feel like there was a bit of a tug and pull between um the community's existence versus you know Ushahidi's general existence and some of which that I probably understand much more now um uh, as a leader. So this is not a this is a story that's not unique to very many you'll talk to many non-profits out there and they'll tell you more or less the same thing at some point in your in your journey you have to figure out how to keep the lights on you have to figure out how to become self-sustainable and at that point for us what seemed like the best path forward was rolling out a software as a service model so basically um charge you know put some feature gating on on the platform itself and start charging fees for some of those features Now of course given our history open source um people not you know people being able to access this tool for free there was going to be some natural resistance to why do i have to pay for this now when i've when i haven't had to pay for it before um and at the same time for us also think about like this is a completely new space the kinds of people who be paying for a service and um the kind of support they will need will be very different and there's a bunch of things that for i personally feel that if we had done differently we probably have different results um things like we it it took us it took us a bit of a lot of time to roll out a new version of the platform and then at the point when we did roll it out we didn't provide a um, a migration path from people on the older version to the new one that i think that's where the friction around what our revenue generation goals versus what our community goals are and i ended up becoming a strong voice for we need to stay we need to stand firm around who we are as an organization we need to stand firm on what we stand for stand firm on making sure that people can access our tools stand firm on being able to provide value in the tool itself and so a lot of my role then kind of shifted into doing things like documentation to help people really understand how to use a tool doing a lot of um training and support and just really trying to surface this feature is really needed uh, at this point um so i guess in many ways i ended up being a very strong advocate um for open source and our users and at the time the board approached me um i think it was a case of our software as a service business model hadn't worked out as well for us and so we were at a critical moment in shahidi's 
exist and really think about where do you want to go. And so my my job over the last two to three years has been really turning that ship around and taking us back to what many people have turned as going back to our roots, centering our work on making the tool accessible to those who need it the most, um, regardless of the financial ability, strengthening our relationship with our, with our open source community um, and rethinking how, how we generate revenue, thinking a lot about um, providing our support and expertise as a thing that is of value as opposed to the tool itself. Being a woman who is an executive director of a global tech organization, do you feel this immense pressure not to fail so you can keep the door open for the next woman? Oh, absolutely. That pressure is there. It is very real. Recognizing that it's... it. When, when you think about women in tech, um, there's a lot of work that has gone into bridging that gap. And so we're finding a lot more uh, people in engineering, ETC. But as you climb up the ladder and go into leadership, that challenge is still there. And so I'm very aware of the fact that I am an African woman at the helm of a global tech organization. And a lot of what I do could set the tone for people who come after me. A lot of it is also just me putting pressure on myself, but that pressure actually does exist. It's, it's, in, it's not only in my best interest to succeed, but it's also in everybody else's interest because I and many others out there, many other fantastic female leaders are actually setting the tone um, for those who will come after us. We are put in a space where we, we can be, a, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful responsibility, but it's also a really big one right? There's younger women out there who are looking at us and saying, hey, I'm seeing that woman up there. She's doing A, B, C, and D. Our success could easily be tied to theirs. It actually could be tied to theirs. Our failures, unfortunately, could also lead them down, down another path. So that's something that I carry with me every day. What, what example am I setting? What legacy am I leaving behind for those who will come after me? Not only for future leadership, but for future women, for my girls and everybody else, what tone am I setting? So it's a it's a big responsibility. <laughs> it's a really big one. Now let's get into the specifics of what Ushahidi is. I will start off with a, some historic background. So Ushahidi is a Swahili word that means testimony. Uh, for those who don't know, um, we had general elections in 2007 that were marked by very high tribal tensions. So when results were announced, violence broke out in different parts um, of the country because the outcome was largely contested. Now, what was happening on the ground at the time was primarily underreported or not reported at all. I remember for myself, I was stuck in my house you know, glued to the TV to get to know what was going on. But there were points where there were either blackouts or, you know, you're, you're watching cartoons on live, on live television. And so what the founders did was come together to find a way to raise the voice of ordinary people. So they set up this web platform where people could text in or send tweets or send emails and talk about what was happening around them. And then they, that information was aggregated and visualized on a map. So it essentially gave Kenyans a voice when no one else could or would. And it also gave those of us who didn't have information a better situational awareness about what was going on, not only around us, but even much further out. Um, I think it was actually a very good resource, especially for people who were out of the country and really worried about what was going on. So that's the origin of the organization. Um, over the last 13 years, you know, we've grown into a global nonprofit tech company whose mission, whose goal is to empower ordinary people and communities to thrive as a result of access to data and tech. We develop tools and services that help ordinary people to mobilize their communities for good, empower them to quickly gather information um, and share that with the world and also just get to understand what's going on. And we do that through our flagship platform um, that's a crowdsourcing tool, basically a tool that allows for massive data collection from different sources. You have SMS, email, Twitter, smartphone applications and the web to help you pull in all of that information into one place, quickly organize it um, and visualize it in a way so that you get a, a, 
a near real time feed of what's going on, but also help you figure out how to best res- best respond to to what's happening around you. It's been used in various various categories of social impact, looking at crisis response. The Haiti earthquake is the one that we're probably most famous for, uh, the Nepal earthquake, most recently for COVID-19, just as a way of connecting citizens with people who can help or just generally tracking what's going on at a time when very little information was being made available. It's been used a lot in the human rights space for advocacy. So just surfacing a lot of what might be going on um, to create awareness, but then also hold people to account in some way. Um, also using the good governance space, so election monitoring and corruption mapping. Think of it like whistleblowing. Hey, I saw this happening, and then being able to forward that to people who can who can then respond. And right now, really thinking very strongly about the role we can play um, in in the climate change space. So that's that's Ushahidi in a long nutshell. Can you go into details the reach of Ushahidi now, and your feelings about how? technology from Africa is being exported to other parts of the world because this is not the place the world expects tech to come from with all the problems that we we have. To this day, 13 years later, we are always mesmerized when we find an Ushahidi instance in a country that we never thought it would ever be in. Um, The tool has been used in more than 160 countries in the last 13 to 14 years. Wow. Um, it's been translated into more than 45 different languages and deployed more than 200,000 times. A tool that was born out of problems you always tend to associate with Africa, low bandwidth, bad governance. And I'll start answering your second question now just because I'm in that train of thought. But Africa has always been seen as a recipient you know, of, of, of innovation. But here we are, and it's not just Ushahidi. I mean, there's so many, you know, you, we're seeing a lot, a lot of innovation coming from the African continent and being exported and, and going out there. And I think that applies very strongly to, to the Ushahidi story. I think one of the things that really enable that wide-scale reach is um, that deliberate effort by the Ushahidi founders to make it open source making sure that they were not locking out anyone from being able to access the tool. Um, the fact that it was very possible for people to not only benefit from using it, but also share that back by pouring back any any improvements that they had made by being able to surface um, lessons that they've learned, which speaks a lot about open culture and how, you know, it just, it, it was almost like providing a skeleton for people to work on. And then people took that skeleton and fleshed it up and made it their own. It also gave them that, that flexibility, which was very important. Second thing is being very deliberate about also making it accessible in the way that people needed to access it. Um, not just making it available in English, because English is in everybody's first language. So whether you're in Spain, whether you're in the Arabic world, that you are able to interact with the tool in the language that you are most um, most comfortable with. Um, and then this third one, which is also just innovating around the tools that people already had access to, making sure that the tool is meeting people where they are. And this idea of starting with the mobile phone, and this quote by the founders always pops up into my head, if it works in Africa, it'll work anywhere. Because again, you started with you know, the, the lowest level as opposed to the highest one and then trying yeah. to figure out how it will then it will then break down break down further. Anytime you talk about building tech tools, the emphasis is always on appropriate. Why that qualifier? Because as technologists, it's very, and it's it's not a bad thing. It, we it's very easy to get drawn into something new and emerging, and trying to find a way for it to solve a problem and realize down the line that this may not have been the best thing to use. And so a lot of the mindset shift that I've had to apply to myself that I'm also seeing a lot of the tech world um, doing more of is really starting with the problem first, identifying what the issue is, identifying who the key stakeholders are, and then having that be the guide into what to then apply. 
So that's that's how I think about the appropriateness. How what is the technology in service of, as opposed to having the tech first and then trying to, it's like trying to fit fit a, a foot that will not fit into the glass slipper. <laughs> really. So that that that's basically how I look at things. Starting off with the problem itself and seeing how best the technology, all of these emerging tools that we're seeing will solve this particular problem. I think that's that's where innovation happens, to be very honest, in my opinion. Yeah, I share the same opinion too. What would be the use if the tool is not the right one to solve the problem, you know? Talk to me about funding and how you access funding and how challenging or easy has it been to keep Ushahidi sustainable? So one point of privilege that I will own is the fact that the founders did such a fantastic job in um, opening up their networks, and they still do to this day. So that's that's kind of like one one challenge out the door already, right? Because they they are well respected in the industry as leaders, as um, pioneers um, in, in the tech space, and that respect and that 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 value still holds to this day. So a lot of a lot of doors that are open to me sometimes are opened by by the founders. Um, and then the fact that I'm also leading an organization that's been here for a while. And so there's also that reputation that sometimes plays plays into it. But I I, I also have to recognize the challenge in being able to access funding, especially um, as you know, uh, an African woman based in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, where most of the funding is coming from from outside outside places. I think one of my biggest concerns when COVID hit was I won't be able to have that kind of face time to be able to bring in bring in the kind of funding that the organization needs. Uh, access to funding, especially for people in the global south, is very difficult, and that becomes even more difficult for women. Um, and part of that is a case of funders trusting or being more open to finding people who look like them in, in, in some cases, in some cases, that's one. Um, you know, do we trust in the people in the global South to be able to manage this, you know, to manage this funding? And it, 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 you then get into spaces where you're doing a lot more reporting and due diligence just to make sure that you're actually somebody who's, what receiving the funding and sometimes that takes you away from actually doing doing the core work but i think it also speaks to the fact that a lot of the funding is also not coming from here like these these are challenges that could um I, i'm not going to use the term easily but could we could make headway if we also saw um more drive from local local investors local philanthropy um, so it's a it's a fairly complicated um, a, a complicated space for me. Um, I, I would say again, access to the right networks, having a strong evidence base of Ushahidi's impact, has been something that I've been able to lean on, and just really trying to find ways of being able to tell that story more. It beats my mind why many local investors still don't see the opportunities that exist in this tech space. I, I wonder why. I've been asking myself that question as well. And through my interactions with um, a group called the, the Bridge Span Group, I know they've also been doing a lot of research into this. And I'll look at it from the perspective of philanthropy first before I jump into the um, the, the for-profit side. And I think what, one, one thing that's a very, very stark difference in philanthropy, say, in the US and in Europe versus philanthropy in Africa is that philanthropy in Africa will go into the public sector. We're going to fixing things like, you know, uh, philanthropists will be willing to pay money to go towards a hospital or pay money to go towards education and things like that. When it comes to some of the other, the, you know, the US and in Europe ETC, for them, some of those systems are already in place and some of them may work or rather work much better. So those gaps in the public systems might not be as big, which opens up the door for them to be able to invest in some of the value add, you know, some of the value add that nonprofits would bring around some of those sectors. But for us in Africa, it's very basic. And so I also do understand if someone has a choice between, okay, I need to put 
this this school here doesn't have adequate resources. I'm going to put my money into that rather than putting money into a tech organization like mine. While it's something hard to swallow, I can understand where that comes from. So that's a very that's a distinction to make um, around the the factors motivating philanthropists um, and the kind of um, environment that they are operating in here versus everywhere else. Now let's move on to Akira Chicks. First of all, the name sounds really cool. How did you come by it? I was studying Japanese um, while in Strathmore, just uh, like a, a an, an an extra course, just because I've been into mangas and my elder cousins and my now husband was also into it. So um, at the time when we were trying to think about a name, because everybody would do this thing where they go and pick a Swahili name, I was like, why don't we check out a Japanese name? And we found the word Akira, which means intelligence and energy. And it was such an apt description of the type of women who are coming together to form this organization. Um, we met at the IHAB launch in 2010, around the time when I was just about to begin my internship with them. Um, and it just, you know, there was just a collective passion for trying to get more women into the tech industry, recognizing our backgrounds. For me, who was still in school, for my other co-founders who are in the workforce um, as the select few female developers and trying to see how we could tip that balance a little bit. So when Akira Chicks began, it was, let's let's start with creating a community for us to get to know one another, get to connect and understand what our challenges are and encourage each other. And as time went by, you know, began really by building a tree from the ground up and really solidifying those roots, thinking about where are career decisions made. We make those decisions when we're very young. Look at me. I decided I wanted to become an engineer while I was while I was a child. And it's because I had those role models right in front of me. I had my mom and my dad. That's not something that, you know, many, many who aren't in urban areas can, can talk about. And so how do we begin to plant plant those seeds at a very young age? How do we inspire young women who are still in primary school or in high school to take up careers, show them that you can actually make it? Um, and so uh, we, you know, built out a couple of different programs. One is a training one that my co-founders have continued to lead um, that targeted women from poor social economic backgrounds who had finished, you know, completed high school, bring them in, take them through a one-year course on technology, um, on entrepreneurship, then at the end of it, put them, provide job placements for them, um, or even help them start their own businesses. Um, next program was, you know, kids, kids camps, um, you know, for children under the, you know, children in primary school as well as girls in high school, just, you know, a, a bit of uh, mentorship as well as training um, over the holidays, just to give them some of those practical skills. And then uh, another arm around community building. So just continuing those meetups where women can network with each other and running an annual conference. And I believe that that's something that the founders have continued to run, even though I left in, in 2017. So that's that's basically Akira Chicks. It's, um, you know, really amazing. Co-founders are doing amazing work right now. The goal, I, I believe the goal for them right now is to train more than 10,000 young women over the next couple of years. They've expanded the training program beyond Kenya. They have students from Rwanda um, and Uganda. And it's it's still just all about ensuring that we're tipping that balance, building um nurturing women who are building solutions for, for the communities in service of the problems in the communities and helping them become leaders. She builds, she serves, she leads. A, a, a lot of what also needs to come out really strongly in my journey is the different individuals who've been there at different stages of my career who helped to put, who noticed a particular skill or noticed um, potential and helped drive me um, in the right direction, whether it's the Ushahidi founders, the Heathers of this world, or the coaches that I have now, it's it's something that I, I I'm I'm also trying to be very intentional about passing along. Looking at my journey, I am someone who joined the team at the lowest, you know, the the the, the lowest level, and I grew up the ranks. It would be interesting to see somebody else on my team do the same thing. I am the classic example of what mentorship and support does. <laughs> I love that. It's a beautiful thing to pay it forward after you have received. You know, the one who gives to you was not selfish. So 
there is really no need to be selfish with yours as well. So you know firsthand how open systems and open source have allowed you to impact the world the way you are doing. Talk to us about your world of open. Open is all I've known <laughs> my entire career. Um, and I I do strongly feel that open, open has probably led me to where I am today, whether it's in terms of the kinds of groups of people that I've been able to interact with, the knowledge that I have been able to amass. Um, you know, it's from things like the, the technical skills. You know, there's even at the point when I was actively building on, on, the, on the tool itself, there's so much value and so much that I would learn from our open source contributors, whether it's around like, you know, something small here and there, or even just learning how different cultures work. Um, this aspect of knowledge sharing is something that really thrives in open systems, that you'll have one person who deployed the platform for elections in that country and another one who deployed it in this other country, and then being willing to come together and share what worked for them, what worked for this other person, and finding the intersection of that to help somebody else, that is extremely powerful. And that's the model that, you know, Ushahidi has built. Or looking at some of the, you know, whether it's the conferences and the events and the types of people that you end up being connected to. Look at the MozFests of this world. Look at um, all things open and the kinds of opportunities it exposes you to, um, like-minded individuals, different ones. Um, it's There's such richness in being open than being closed, to be, to be very honest. There's, whether it's um, skills development, whether it's um, knowledge sharing, whether it's access to networks, it's, it's, it's wild, to be very honest. Your husband is also a software engineer. Yes, um, he is a senior, he's a senior software engineer with a company uh, here in Kenya. I wonder how your home is like. <laughs> <laughs> wow, well, I will describe it to the best of my ability. There are a lot of gadgets. There are quite a lot of gadgets. Some used, some unused. Yeah, he has, because right now um, we we oscillate between working from home and working from the office because of COVID, mostly working from home. He has his own setup in one, one room. I have my own setup in another room. Um, and at some point, our eldest, our eldest daughter was actually, uh, you know, doing online classes um, in, in, the, in the office space that I work out of. So you'd come in and find she's on her laptop there, mommy's on her laptop there, daddy's on his laptop on the <laughs> other end. So yeah. <laughs> Tech <Thai> family. <laughs> oh yeah, we're we are proudly so, proudly so. In yes. fact, our struggle right now is really teaching the kids to embrace boredom and move away from the gadgets. Ah. Move away from gadgets. So that's meant like for us, because I mean, our core work really does need us to be on, on our machines. We have to be very intentional about the times when it's just us with the family. Like, take a step away from the machine, from the phone, or whatever it is. So, yeah. Right now, I think our, our big struggle is like my, my youngest comes in and she's like, Mommy, I want to have a meeting because she's so used to. Mommy telling her I am in a meeting while I'm on my laptop. So there'll be times like I've gone and got on my lunch break. I'll come find her plopped on my chair. Quiet, I'm having a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I do not doubt that they will follow in our footsteps. I think so. I, th I think they'll catch the tech bug as well. I, I, I think yeah, and so. unless there's a very strong aversion to who we are as people, <laughs> they are going down that path. <laughs> And, and I think it's good, you know, like I think we both said during this conversation, like we need more people, particularly women, to get into tech. And if they can catch the bug at an early age, why not? You know, why not? And my final question, what advice will you give to young girls who want to get into tech? I think one of the first ones is you can do hard things. That's you, you need to recognize that you can do hard things. Second thing would be do those things even when you're afraid. Don't let your fear hold you back. Be open. Be Put yourself in, you know, even when those doors seem like they're closing, break that door open. Find ways to plug yourself in. And of course, as you're going in, find ways to also bring others with you. 
open those doors for for other people um in practical ways as somebody who's probably starting out plug yourself into the local tech communities there's a lot of either right now i think they're mostly virtual virtual meetups attend attend those there's so much value in some of the networks that you're going to be opened to there's so much more to learn be very open minded about most of those spaces be open to asking questions don't be afraid to ask questions nothing is stupid ask always ask and 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 you receive be very clear about what your goals are as well identify somebody who can be your mentor but also recognize that that's something that has to be driven by you as well so take some time and really think about where it is that you where it is that you want to go it's been a wonderful time with you angela this was a lovely conversation thank you so much for hosting me you've earned your spot in this industry angela and it's up 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 from here on That was Angela Lungati, Executive Director of Ushahidi. Thank you for listening to Inspiring Open, a podcast series from Wikilove's Women. This first series of Inspiring Open was funded through the International Relief Fund for Organizations in Culture and Education 2021, an initiative of the German Federal Foreign Office, the Gothi Institute and other partners, and an annual grant from the Wikimedia Foundation. If you enjoyed today's show, subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your podcasts so you never miss an episode. Feel free to share, rate, and review us. We appreciate the support. You can also tag us in your posts. We are at Wikilove's Women on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'll leave you with the words of Ntozake Shange. Sisterhood is important because we are all we have to stand on. We have to stand near and by each other, pray for one another, and share the joys and the difficulties that women face in the world today. If we don't talk about it amongst ourselves, then we are made silent by the patriarchy, and that serves us no purpose. Until next time, look after yourselves and your sisters. And remember, be inspired, be challenged, be bold. I am Betty Kankambwedu, and you've been listening to Wiki Loves Women, Inspiring Open.